for people that are coming from the mental landscape of of austerity the idea that you should be running fiscal surpluses or high deficits are bad i mean obviously we don't need to get into that that too much for a lot of people who've been sort of um, encumbered with that debate they'll be thinking oh wow debt to gdp 100 percent uh, deficit 14 percent so that's really really bad so i mean mm -hmm. to what extent can all of europe for instance and the united states and japan uh, run uh, fiscal deficits and for how long is that is that a plausible thing there are some people that think it is but what's your view on that no absolutely i mean uh, it's essential at this moment as well that they do um and uh you know anything else will be will be disastrous we're seeing an absolutely catastrophic collapse in private demand um and we're very likely to see a shocked reaction in which private investment and households who've suffered this epic shock retreat into higher levels of saving and lower levels of consumption and um and furthermore we're going to see a classic downward spiral in which hundreds of millions not millions or tens but hundreds of millions of people have, have essentially been uh, made unemployed in various different ways it's novel forms of unemployment as well so their consumption is going to be down and um against that backdrop it's absolutely essential that that that, that governments um um make up the slack and and uh, provide provide demand for for the economy i mean you could make the case for degrowth and people you know before the shock were making the argument for degrowth on on grounds of climate sustainability and that's an argument that should be seriously entertained but no one planned for it this way um and the risk of course is that it it will be profoundly inequitable and folks like myself and imagine you as well who, who've got the, the resources of relative comfort and a nice place to live and can get through this crisis will broadly speaking be okay but there are hundreds of millions of people who are absolutely not in that condition for them uh, it, it's essential that various types of bridging finance or just frankly grants um, are, are provided in this in this situation and so yes that will increase government debt but Government debt's a problem for the aftermath, and it's a, I mean, it's to my mind really an open question whether it's a problem at all. Um, it's a problem if you allow debt markets to exercise a veto over you. But all all the major sovereign states, not all countries in the world, but all of the advanced economy states, have enough autonomy to manoeuvre their way through this without becoming the hostages of of aggressive bond markets. Not true for emerging markets and developing states because the monetary system of the world is intensely hierarchical. But uh, the advanced economies have the capacity to manage this, and they also have the capacity to soften the trade-offs for the emerging markets and the poorer, the truly poor, the, the, the low-income countries around the world if they choose to do so. And that's being debated in Washington at, as we speak, literally right now, in these minutes and hours. Um, that's a huge topic at the G20, G7, World Bank, IMF meetings, which are happening virtually um, right now. So you, I mean, you're of a position as I think any any reasonable or rational person is, with the exception perhaps of you know um, uh, Arthur Laffer or Ian Duncan Smith. Generally speaking, we want full demobilisation of the economy. We're going to have to run deficits because of a, a downturn in demand. Yeah, it's going to mean higher public debt, but we're also going to see private household debt because, of course, people are taking out loans to just. Yeah tie themselves over we may see higher rates of corporate debt yeah. which is why it's so important to keep the financial system going right because that it's not for its own sake this isn't a crisis like 2008 where the banks were going to pull down this is we need the credit system to operate whether it's you continuing to pay i don't know your cleaner even if they can't work for you because they need to continue their livelihood so you extending that private support um, whether it's you uh, 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 borrowing uh, on your credit card or whatever else, we all need to tide our way through this crisis through various types of credit, which is which is why maintaining that credit system is so is so is so crucial, particularly at this moment. But how, how does this look? Say say we have a vaccine in twelve months. Say that generally speaking, you know, th things the long term trends are no different to what they were, which weren't great before mm -hmm. December. Mm -hmm. macroeconomic trends globally global south the us europe and, and so on what would a solution look like would you have to see a move to inflation to sort of get rid of some of these debts well, would you uh, have to have debt you know debt forgiveness haircuts what yeah. what because even even the idea of austerity uh, mm -hmm. the idea of oh we would have further cuts 
that, that, that there would be so much debt held by so many different entities at so many different levels. It doesn't seem yeah. a plausible solution. Yeah. I mean, by far and away, the most attractive scenario would be the 1950s, 1960s scenario, which is responsible finance. I mean, the 50s and 60s, we think of them as the Keynesian period. In fact, they were running surpluses of various types. I wouldn't advocate a surplus surplus now, but by all means, obviously, run down the crisis level spending. Uh, but then on the other hand, rapid growth in nominal GDP, which is the, the combination of inflation and actual economic growth. Um, and that erodes the debt to GDP ratio and inflation bites away. It's essentially a tax on everyone holding a monetary claim on anyone else. And that's you know only fair under the circumstances. It's equally distributed. It's silent and deadly nevertheless. So mm -hmm. It's a very effective way of dealing with a monetary debt overhang like this. The problem, and it's a huge problem, and it was a huge problem at the beginning of this year before the crisis hit and had preoccupied monetary policymakers for years now, is they can't get inflation to go. And now, that begs questions then, and the most obvious reason as to why it's difficult to make inflation go is there's no bargaining power in the economy right now. And one of the reasons you have to remind people is that they did in fact quite deliberately crush the bargaining power of one of the most powerful groups which was organized labor in the 70s and 80s so they shouldn't be surprised now that wages don't respond in the way that they used to right so there's a real kind of forgetfulness on the part of people engaged in conventional policy making like whoops hang on why is this dog dead why if we give it more leash does it not run well you you fundamentally change the balance of power and and also by Globalization, of course, increased the global labor supply spectacularly, so reduced people's bargaining power. In any sense, in any case, we were dealing with the problem of what folks had started calling lowflation. So it would be wonderful if we could get to four or five percent inflation in the aftermath of this. That would be by far and away the easiest way of dealing with it. Uh, it's just unlikely that we will be able to engender that because the environment's quite likely to be deflationary because of the suppression of consumption and the shock to confidence. So, so to my mind, by far and away, the easiest thing to do is to park this debt on the balance sheet of the central bank, uh, as much of it as you can, and park it there. <laughs> it begs the question of what it's doing there and how you unwind it from there, but it postpones the question. And above all, what it means is the political system is not flooded with the toxic question of public finance, which did so much damage to the recovery after 2008. Paul Krugman has this great line, it, it all went wrong in 2010. Yeah. which he means basically that the political system became overwhelmed by an argument that it's just proven in most democratic systems incapable of resolving in an intelligent way. Most The vast majority of economists will adopt the kind of functional finance view which says the debt's largely neutral to indifferent with regard to the performance of the economy as long as you can place it somewhere safe. Very few people would actually turn it into like, you know, the be all or end all of economic policy. But but conservative politicians across the world did that in the US, in Europe, in, in Britain, of course, with disastrous consequences for a bubble for public investment, but also for basic public services and for the welfare of the most vulnerable in society. So that is what we want to avoid, because there is a distinct risk of the debts which were run up in this crisis being used essentially as a weapon against progressive policy of any kind for years to come.